So this is the next lecture in DNA repair, and uh, it's going to be focusing on nucleotide excision repair, which this is different than base excision repair because um, instead of base excision repair, we're only removing the base and largely leaving the sugar phosphate backbone intact. In this case, we're removing the base and part of the sugar phosphate backbone. So this is going to be taking care of a lot of the mammalian UV damage, our cyclobutane, primidine dimers, and our 6,4 photo products, um, because we don't have photolyases that are able to take care of this. This also, of course, works in uh, prokaryotes in the dark um, when they don't have the light to be able to do their photolyase activity. Um, this is also going to take care of a lot of alkylation damage and certain types of crosslinks. The actual pathway itself is pretty similar across all organisms, and it begins with damage recognition, uh, where we have our pyrimidine dimer. If you remember, um, or other types of damage, of course. If you remember, the pyrimidine dimers will cause some sort of um, 30 degree kink in the backbone or a bend in the backbone, and that's actually what's going to be recognized by this uh, pathway. It's not going to recognize a specific sequence on the major or the minor grooves. So after damage recognition comes uh, the excision nuclease, which is going to do the actual cutting on either side of the lesion. And you can see here that it's going to cut out more than just the actual affected uh, nucleotides. So it cuts out several more. Then the uh, helicase will come along and it will remove the oligonucleotide created by the cuts. And again, it's only going to remove a single stranded bit of DNA, leaving the remainder or the uh, complementary strand intact, which will then be used by a uh, DNA polymerase to uh, create new or a new complementary strand or to replace the strand that we just removed using the complementary strand as a uh, template. And of course, it's going to put in the correct bases at the site of our lesion. Um, as I mentioned, the basic pathway is very similar across all organisms, but it's going to differ at the level of the enzymes that are doing the excision nuclease activity, the DNA helicase activity, and the polymerase and ligase activity. Uh, we're going to do prokaryotes and eukaryotes sim uh, separately, of course, because that's how it works in molecular biology. We figure it out in prokaryotes usually, and then we move on to our understanding of the eukaryotes. In the prokaryotes, the major damage uh, specific endonuclease system is going to be this UVR ABC. This is going to be the damage specific endonuclease and so this is going to be doing the uh, recognition and cutting of the actual damage base pairs. And so it's got three major proteins that we start with UVRA, UVRB, and UVRC and these work together so we call it the UVR ABC endonuclease. We start out with UVRA it's got two UVRB binding sites, two nucleotide binding sites, and an ATPase. And so it's going to bind to UVRB. As we know, it's going to work with UVRB. It's also going to be responsible for the recognition of the actual damage site. The UVRA, it will complex with UVRB, and this is not while it's on DNA. So as you know, there's no DNA in this picture. UVRA and B will wind up in complex. UVRB also has a binding site for UVRC, but while it's bound to UVRA, UVRB can't bind to UVRC. So the process begins with the binding of UVRB to UVRA. After UVRA and B bind, they're going to now recognize DNA, and so they'll bind upstream of this damage here, and UVRA will be responsible for actually localizing the damage and actually recognizing the, the damage. So remember, this is going to be due to some sort of change in the structure of the DNA. It's not going to recognize a sequence. So UVRA recognizes the damage in the DNA for UVRB. What it's going to do is it's going to get UVRB in the right spot so it can be by the, U, by the damaged site. Uh, we call this a molecular matchmaker, which I think is really hilarious um, because it makes me think of Fiddler on the Roof. Um, but what is actually meant by that is UVRA is positioning the damage perfectly for UVRB. Without UVRA, UVRB wouldn't be able to get to our damage spot here. And that's important because once we have UVRA and B in complex with the recognized damage, 
and UVRA is going to recognize on either side of the actual damage itself. There's going to be a conformational change and the DNA will form this hairpin structure. We call that a hairpin structure. And the result of that hairpin structure is that we are going to have UVRA kicked off and UVRB will be left in a stable complex with the DNA. You'll note here that uh, UVRB is changed a bit from its structure down here and we see that the DNA is now going through this active site and it acts sort of as a helicase where we're able to unwind the DNA. So it's going to unwind the DNA on either side of the actual damage as we show here with the star of course. But it's still in this stable complex with the DNA and it unwinds it. So again, just to remind you, the steps were that we have UVR A and B wind up in complex. They'll bind to the DNA. UVR A will wind up recognizing the damage. There will be this conformational change and the formation of this hairpin loop. Another conformational change that kicks UVR A off and now we have UVR B in complex with the DNA. So since UVRB is no longer in complex with UVRA, it's now possible for it to complex with UVRC. And here we have a picture of UVRC. UVRC has two domains, an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain, and that's connected by a flexible linker. And this is important because of the function of UVRC. UVRC is going to do the actual cutting of the backbone, and it does it in two steps. First, the N-terminal domain is going to cut three prime, so on the three prime end of the actual damage itself. And then second, the C-terminal is ter terminus is going to cut on the five prime end. So we have UVRC that's going to bind to UVRB at the site of the unwound damaged DNA. The N-terminus is going to cut first, and then the C-terminus is going to cut first. So what we've done now is we've done our first major steps of the pathway, and we've got the damage recognized, we've got the damaged parts cut out. So the last thing that has to happen is we have to finally repair it. And this is going to be UVRD and a DNA polymerase as well as a ligase. So UVRD and DNA polymerase 1 are going to recognize that site. UVRD will now excise the damaged fragment, so it'll do the removal of the oligonucleotide. And DNA polymerase will now work in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction and lay down a new DNA strand based on the template of the undamaged strand. Once this is done, DNA ligase comes in and seals the NIC, and we have completely sealed uh, or repaired our DNA in a prokaryote. A lot of what we know about eukaryotic nucleotide excision repair is because of the disease where nucleotide excision repair is not working. It's called xeroderma pigmentosum, and it's a recessive disorder, so we can have that means that we have heterozygotes who pass on two copies of the recessive gene and then they have a one in four chance of having a child who is going to be affected by the disorder. Um, the affected individuals such as this child here from Nepal will have a 1000 fold greater likelihood of developing skin cancer especially in areas that are exposed to sun and they're extremely sensitive to sun in general and get sunburned very easily. Uh, the median age of onset of cancer, skin cancer, in these patients is about eight years of age if they don't have appropriate precautions taken in treatment. And this is because the UV damage is causing um, these cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers or 6,4 photoproducts and they aren't being repaired. And so these, the mutation is being passed on to future lines of cells as they divide. Um, and so the amazing thing is that we've been able to study cells from these patients uh, and learn a lot about exactly what is happening for nucleotide excision repair. And what we're going to see is that there's going to be a lot of proteins with this XP in their name. The first one that we'll see on the next slide is XPC. So if you see that, know that that's a protein that was first, whose function was first identified using an XP patient, um, cells from an XP patient or cell-free extracts from those. So there are two major types of eukaryotic nucleotide excision repair, and we're going to talk first about what's called the global pathway, the global genome excision repair pathway, which is for DNA that isn't currently being transcribed. There's also transcription-dependent or transcription-coupled, sorry, nucleotide excision repair, and that's for DNA that's actively being transcribed. But since most 
DNA is not being actively transcribed, we'll, we focus on the global pathway. Um, the uh, transcription coupled pathway is going to be very similar to what we're going to talk about here, except for this first step is primarily the biggest difference. Instead of having specific proteins that are going to recognize the damage, as we'll see as I go through this slide, it's going to be the RNA polymerase. Um, so just like for the uh, prokaryotic setup, we start out with a helix distortion lesion. And so if we remember the CP CBP um, mutations due to UV light are going to cause a helix distortion. So this is about a 30 degree helix distortion for the thymine thymine dimers. And that's going to be recognized by our first XP protein, XPC, that's in complex with another one, HHR23B. This is a yeast homologue, which means it was first identified in the DNA repair machinery of yeast. But these two work together to recognize this DNA bending. So it's again not recognizing a specific sequence of DNA, it's recognizing the actual damage. So these are going to recognize the damage and they'll recruit another protein, TF2H, which is called transcription factor 2H. Transcription factor 2H has two subunits here, which we'll see on the next slide. We've got two subunits of TF2H and the first one is XPBD sorry, XP, XPB and XPD. These are both helicases. So TF2H is made out of the subunits of XPB and XPD, and they're both helicases. Um, XPB is a five prime to three prime helicase, and XPD is a three prime to five prime helicase. So they open up the DNA in opposite directions. And this is going to be a damage verification step. So XPD is going to unwind the DNA until it hits not only this distortion here, but it has to be a chemically modified base. So it's not just recognizing that there's something wrong with the backbone, but it's noting that there's also something wrong with the base itself. So thus in order to be fixed by this pathway the DNA damage has to cause distortion in the backbone and a chemical modification of the base. So once we have this damage verification by XPD we're going to have XPB open it up even further and so we have a nice what looks like a replication bubble but it's actually just to repair the damaged uh, base here. So again that's the TF2H which is the XPB and XPD that are going to recognize the actual damage and are going to open up the strand so that it can be fixed. So whereas before we had just one protein that came in to do the uh, cutting, the excision, we now have a whole bunch of proteins. First of all, we get RPA. RPA is a single-stranded binding protein, and that's going to bind to the complementary strand to keep it open. Then we got XPG and XPA. These are going to come in, and XPG is going to do some of the actual excision along with XPF. And so XPF is at one end and XPG is at the other end and it's going to cut the actual backbone. XPG cuts th at the three prime end of the damage and XPF cuts at the five prime end of the damage. After that's been cut, it's going the damaged oligonucleotide is removed and now we just have a polymerase that comes in. But unlike where we had DNA polymerase 1 coming in in the prokaryotic system. Now we've got to get polymerase delta and if it's or polymerase epsilon. If it's epsilon, it can just sit down, use the template strand as or use the complementary strand as a template and lay down its DNA. But with polymerase delta, because its processivity on its own is low, it needs PCNA and RFC. PCNA is the clamp and RFC is the clamp loader. This will start now laying down in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. So polymerase delta will lay down new nucleotides, again using the complementary strand as a template. It'll get to the end of the removed, the excised area, and DNA ligase will come in and seal that. So this is the global repair um, pathway, global genomic or genome repair pathway for eukaryotes. And I mentioned that it's different because these are for bits of DNA that are damaged that are not being actively transcribed. If it's being actively transcribed, 
the major difference is that the recognition at the beginning, the recognition of the actual damage is by RNA polymerase because RNA polymerase cannot proceed past this kind of damage. And so in that case, RNA polymerase is going to recognize the damage and then there's a few differences in the recruitment of the um, enzymes to do the actual repair. But in general, the process is just about the same. And that about covers uh, nucleotide excision repair.